Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you at. Welcome to Saturday class of uh, TMM Academics. Today's topic is troubleshooting top mount refrigerator. This is a very confusing call that could trick you because the customer says that it's not cooling properly. I want to demonstrate that we put a cup of water in here. If you listen, water is frozen solid. The reason that the water is frozen solid, yeah, mute. Set the mute. All right. The re uh, so the reason this water is solid is because anything under 32 degrees will freeze water. But this is the problem. What's the freezer compartment supposed to be? You may not have to unmute them. I believe it is unmuted. Freezer department, so freezer compartment is supposed to be zero. Fresh food compartment is supposed to be 37. So we got another person entering the room. Good old Rudy. What's up, brother Rudy? So again. Freezer compartment is supposed to be zero, 37. This is one of those instances that if you go, if you're one of those guys or gals that like to touch, you'll be tricked and you'll think this thing is working fine. You'll even fight with the customer and say, I don't, I don't see no problems. But the reason that we know our temps is we use my infrared gun and it gave me 23 degrees. So yes, in theory, this freezer is cold enough that it will freeze the water and it will trick you if you use just your hand. But it's always recommended to use a temperature measuring device. Now, fresh food compartment, we're at 33. So our fresh food compartment is, is, is cooling appropriately. It's our upper compartment and it's not. This is more than likely they're gonna call you and complain about ice cream, Melting, they're gonna talk about their meat. So now that we know the temperatures, especially up top, we have to go into the troubleshooting phase of it now, bro. So the first thing that while we're might be in, in an open environment, but more than likely this thing is tucked off into a, a to a cabinet somewhere. And there's like shelves and a, a probably, a, you know, something over here. So we don't have the luxury that we can just go around. So while I have the refrigerator up against the wall, the first couple of things I like to do is I like to listen to my fan. And do I hear it? And I do hear it. Second thing I like to do is I like to look at my the rear of my evaporator wall. I like to feel for frost. Do, do I hear any the fan hitting anything? Another guy coming in. So now that you know I hear my fan and I don't see no frost build up, and you can always tell by just scratching, you know, take your hands and, and you you'll hear it. We actually have a fridge back there that has a frost problem. Another thing I like to do while I got the refrigerator in this position is I like to look at my gaskets. Am I getting the proper seal? A, a little hack that I like to do is say you had your phone with you, right? And say it's one of those big boys. And you, you know, you can't see the top of the gasket. This it's just a small unit. What I like to do is I like to use my phone. I take my phone. And what I do is I, I, I flip my camera and I just look downward at my seal. So I'm here, I look at my seal. Then I come under it. And I look underwards, I look under here as well. And I look for my seal. Now, then my gasket is, is, is in good shape. My evaporator fan is running. I'm gonna have to do the task of pulling the unit out. So in the customer's house, I'm gonna inspect the floor. <clears throat> what do I see? 
If it's damaged already, it's probably a good time to stop and take a picture. You know, prepare your area. Sometimes there are islands behind you. Behind me, there's the desk. Sometimes these the same skill when you pull out, you want to be very careful and you want to know that once you're pulling out, you got to get behind it. So if you could only go up to here, you pushing on it, well, guess what? When you push the unit back, you're going to have a dent on here. So be mindful to your environment when you pull in the fridge out. So now that we pull the fridge out, you're going to look at a couple things. Our condensers over here. Our condensers over here. It's not. It's not too too lengthy, you know. But I could tell somebody worked on this unit. What are the indications that someone worked on this unit is I see my fittings here. These access fittings is, is, is dead giveaways that somebody has been here. Now, I could still service the unit, make sure my compressors, my compressors hot to the touch. <clears throat> That's not a good sign. Let's do an amp check on this. Another thing that I see, somebody threw a three in one. This doesn't have the original relay and the overload. So we're gonna do an amp check on it, see where we at. Huh? No, the thing's a mess. But we gotta, that's what we're here for. Okay, so we're gonna come in now to our to our compressor. We're gonna look for our L1 and our neutral. Coming down here, I see the pink and the, and the red, uh, uh, white and red. I'm gonna go around either one of these, put my, my amp meter or my um, clamp, uh, volt meter on amps. Right here, guys. And again, you guys, this is a promotional video. Again, please go on over to tmmacademics.com. These are our Saturday classes. We opened it up to the YouTube world today. So you in the YouTube community, please hit the like button. These are what these guys come on Saturdays, and this is the kind of training that we do live. Okay, so our drain pan is a mess. So let's drain that out. And let's get our amp feeding. So I'm gonna go around either one. It's giving me 1.26, 1.28. That's okay. One to one point five, Frederick. That's a good number for me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not typically alarmed just yet, but I'm still gonna continue my diagnosis. Now I'm gonna hook up my gauges. At this point, I, I have reason to believe that I have a problem with my sealed system. I'm a little concerned on these joints here. And I'll show the YouTube guys. Richard, can you can you help me zoom in on the zoom? I want to show these guys these uh, joints here. And while I'm not a fan of them, we're gonna inspect them. But look at that. I don't know who did that. That looks nice. So this was done by someone who it was doesn't it's a tech, it don't matter the mystery. Some guy we came behind in the field. And we got this over here. You know what I'm saying? So we got, this looks okay. This looks okay. This looks okay. Look at that hot side back there. Chink it in there. It's okay. The, the, take the drain pan out so we can see it. There. there you go. That is it. Oh yeah. It's a beauty. Phone's in the way. It's all good. Okay. So now, 
Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to enter into the sealed system and see what's going on here. Now, ideal pressures on the sealed system is zero on our low side. You could raise it just zero on our low side. And um, it's zero on our low side. And you want like 120 to 130 on your hot side with a, with a normal operating 130 for a 120 volt compressor. With, with that out the way, what we're going to do is we're going to enter into the system and see if those readings reflect what's going on over here. Okay, now, what we got now is this unit is in a vacuum, seven inches mercury. Okay, this unit is in a vacuum. So this unit is actually uh, telling me that something's going on here. Remember, we, we said we wanted zero, right? So at this point, I'm not just going to make the assumption that I have the leak. What I'm going to do is, at this point, I'm going to do something called an equalization test. And what this equalization test is going to do is, I'm going to hook up to my hot side, being that somebody uh, hooked up this filter dryer here. And I'm gonna get my reading over here on my hot side. And I got uh 120. So that's what I got right there. Uh what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unplug the unit. What's up? Unit. Eight point two or negative. It's a vacuum. Vacuum, yeah. And one twenty. I, I do want to point out. Sure. Go ahead. All right, guys. Real quick, I want to point something out. Don't mean to uh, to get into Brandon's demonstration. This is negative eight point two. These are digital gauges, so it's not the same thing as an analog gauge where it's eight inches into a vacuum mercury HG. When you've got like gauges with a needle and you got above and below zero, below zero is zero to 30 inch vacuum, and that's mercury vacuum. This one here is PSI, you know, like positive pressure, you have PSI. And when it's showing this 8.2, this is 8.2 inches vacuum pounds per square inch, not mercury. So this is actually a deeper vacuum than it would be if it's on an analog gauges. We were using these for the first time and I was not too familiar with the digital gauges. I've always used analog all, all, all my life. Um, and every time we tried to pull a vacuum on a system for service, it wouldn't go below 14.7. And I thought there was something wrong with the vacuum pump or the gauges, but 14.7 is the same as a 30 inch vacuum on your analog gauges. So this minus 8.2, is not the same as 8.2 inches on your gauge that has like a needle. So I just want you to know that this is a lot deeper vacuum, which means this unit here is low on freon. But I'll let Brandon go ahead and take over on the rest. Thank you, Richard, thank you, thank you. Again, man, we're very grateful to have Rick part of the team, the real MVP. Okay, so back to what I was saying. Again, I don't just wanna jump into, okay, we got a leak and this and that. I want to equalize the system. I want to unplug it and I want to see my pressure from my high side and my pressure from my low side react. What's going to happen is while one is way down here and the other one's way up here, when you unplug it, they're going to kind of want to balance out and meet somewhere in the middle. So. Oh, that was rude. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do that now and observe that. Can they see the pressure? No. Let's bring it in a little. Okay. Just I go too close. I can't see you and everything else. So. Oh, I can't see like what you're doing on the machine. All right, hold on. That's unplugged. Can you kill that from that side? Can I kill what? Can you unplug it from that? Yeah. Yes, you can. Right. Okay, so we unplugged the unit. Are and we... now let's observe our, our pressures. See what's happening here. So as you notice, our high side is rising. I'm sorry, our high side is lowering and our low side is rising. Here's our, our high, here's our low. Let's change the um, 134.8. Right. Guys, important observation. This is your pressure, but what's changing when you change your refrigerant is your actual uh, temperature. Okay. The signs of a unit that has a bad, uh, what's, what, what we call restriction, is when you have slow equalization rates. This one is moving pretty good. What I mean by moving pretty good is it, it's doing that meaning in the middle act. It, it's doing that song and dance. It's doing it pretty good, you know? So if you had a restriction, what would happen is it would take a really long time for that to happen, if it even happens. And that's how you could tell that you had a restriction. That's an important tool right? I just gave you. I'll say it one more time. When the equalization, your high side and your low side, they're going to want to meet in the middle. When you have a, a, a restriction, your high side and your low side, they take a long time to meet, if they ever meet somewhere in the middle. So this guy here, again, the whole equalization test should take, I don't know, two, three minutes, five minutes. And... Um, It's almost there. So now that I know I don't have no restriction, I'm leaning more now toward a leak. Because what are my options? I either have an inefficient compressor, which I know that's not the case. I know that because my low side was in a vacuum and my high side, we read something like 120. So I know that my, 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 uh, compressor is doing its job. It's a pump. It's doing its job. It's a motor. So it's circulating the freon. So I ruled that out. I know it's not overcharged because if it was overcharged, I would have really high readings. And another sign and an indication of a really high charge system is you'll actually see frost on, on, your, on your copper lines. So I think I'm only left with two other scenarios at that point. Either I have a restriction or I have a leak. I ruled out the restriction because, again, it's equalizing at a really good rate. So it's left me to now I have a restriction. So a couple of things I can do with the unit off. And, and one thing I'm going to do is remember, this pressure that's in this system, it, it's trying to escape right now. It's looking for any possible way out. So I don't even really have to put nitrogen in the system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of my leak detector, and I'm just going to go around some of these um, fittings here because there's positive pressure in the unit now. So let me get my leak detector, and let's do that. So we haven't even pre-tested it out. So we're testing it and checking it out just like as if you would when you first come into customer's house. I'm going to every point of, of uh, work that was done on this. Any, okay. any type of welding and soldering, that's where I'm going at.
Okay. I'm not seeing nothing so far. Another thing, you guys, you can even feel it sometimes sputtering. I never, I'm not a big proponent of them. They go crazy for no reason. What are you, your thoughts to that? I'm more, I like smoking bubble, what I'm doing here. Well, both are acceptable as far as troubleshooting leaks, but electronic leak detectors, you know, they go off as soon as they smell Freon, which, which is okay. But when you got multiple brace joints that are close together, even in AP, EPA uh, certification test, they ask about the leak detector. And electronic leak detectors are basically used to find the general area of a leak, which might tell you if you look at the suction line and the discharge line over there, um, they're so close together that if one of them was leaking, you couldn't tell which pipe was leaking sometimes, especially if you had a, a force draft condenser fan. Um, bubbles or soap are the answer for when you're trying to pinpoint and identify which one of those brace joints are leaking. So electronic leak detector is good, but you're, sometimes you're going to have to resort to using the soap to find out which one of those joints are leaking. Okay, guys, I, I, I honestly, how much pressure we got in the system? 37? See, it, it pretty much equalized. That large, uh, that large uh, scope and range of uh, eight inches vacuum and 120, that large, you know, distance for it now to meet somewhere in the middle is what's letting me know that the system is equalized, okay? So now I got pressure trying to get out of this. Another thing too is if I wait long enough, what I like about digital is once it does stabilize and the unit does have the leak, you'll start seeing your numbers in your gauge go down. Again, these are little brother B hacks, brother B hacks. So again, even if you don't, even without having tapped in, you haven't done anything, I'm just going to wait till they, get, they both get to, to the same number. And then I, my systems equalize, and then I'm just going to observe the decline in pressure. And that is, a, is another indication of a leak. And guys, I, I, I haven't seen the questions uh, Brother Rick's doing that, but if anybody does, please enter it. I'm looking at the screen now. Uh, but you guys can unmute yourself and actually verbally ask the question if you want. Yeah. Oh, okay, she's almost there. This is why I like digital, guys, because on analog, it, it, it's very hard to see these uh, details. Okay, she's almost there. For the novice, they represent pressure, pressure in the system, freon pressure. Well, I think I think what they're asking. Um, well, what Brandon's doing is two things. One, uh, he said it earlier. Maybe understand is when the unit's running, the pressures inside are one is very high, one is very low. When you turn the compressor off. Both sides of the system, remember, it's one complete system. They're connected together. So both pressures should eventually be identical on both sides. Or maybe like you could see it's that one's 0 0.2 and 0 0.8 difference. Um, but he said like if the capillary tube or something in the system had a restriction, those pressures would not equalize. So by stopping the compressor and seeing the pressures on both sides of the system come out to be the same, we know if we have a restriction in our system. And I think that that's one of the things that he's trying to identify here. Then when he turns it off and the pressures are equal, if he sees those pressures dropping, like you see it says 33 and the other one says 33.5, it starts going 32, 31, yeah. 30. We have that, and that indicates that the whole system itself is leaking. Excellent point. Excellent point. I couldn't have said it better. I couldn't have said it better. Listen, when, what I mean, Rudy, listen, when we, when we, these gauges, 
that we are, are hooking up now give us an x-ray vision into this system, into all of this copper tubing and this mad mess. We, we don't know like what we're dealing with. So this this um these gauges, when we hook them up to that, they give us an insight on what's going on with the system. So again, on this side, we refer to this as your high. This is the condenser. We refer to this on the high. Typically, this runs 120, 130. That's your PSI. That's what's happening here. That should be the pressures in here. On the inside, the evaporator, you like at a zero pressure. Uh, no, yeah, zero. So what happens is uh, that's in the freezer compartment. And those differences in pressure, when you unplug the unit, the compressor's not working. They, they kind of don't have the desire to be so all over the place. They kind of just want to relax and settle out and meet somewhere in the middle. Again, if you had a restriction anywhere in this system, that wouldn't be able to accomplish because it would prevent those pressures from coming to the middle because of a restriction somewhere in the unit. The refrigerant can't flow. Does that make sense, Rudy? Now, let's see what we've got. Again, these are Brother B hacks. Okay, we're now getting into the 32 mark. So I'm 100% I'm positive now that we have a leak. See, this guy's going to start going to 32 now. It's 32.9 and so forth. Until it eventually goes all the way down to zero. <clears throat> and when you turn the unit on, you'll really be in a vacuum. All right? Okay. So look at Rudy. Thank you for catering to the lowest common denominator. Rudy, in 10 years, you'll be teaching. I'm the lowest common denominator. All right. So we got all of this going on now. Right now, we have to ask ourselves, can we go to the board? I want to do a drawing piece. Ignore that. That was from a warranty company seminar I did the other day. For all intents and purposes, what I'm going to demonstrate is going to be in the middle of this unit. Okay, so our sealed system, right, begins with our compressor, right? Now, after that compressor, it's going to go to our condenser, right? We'll just represent that with some squiggly lines as such. Then it's gonna go into our filter dryer. Capillary. Evaporator. Back home. Now my leak could be anywhere in this thing. My, 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 my leak could be anywhere in this thing. You know how we... <laughs> uh, I digress. So, our leak is somewhere in this system. It could be here. Now, guys, I want to make one side note about this particular part of our tubing. This here is called our yoder loop. Or, some people call it hot, hot loop. What's hot gas. Hot gas. Never learned of that. And what else? Every manufacturer, hot gas, hot gas. Yeah, you know, but Same again, thing. don't get caught up in the particulars. Just know that this this portion of copper tubing runs interior of the unit. Normally, where the freezer gasket meets the bulkhead, they do that because it's warm and it prevents moisture buildup when the gasket makes contact. So we can't test that and see that if it has a leak, but there is a way to, to check that for a leak. So this is one area of concern for me. Another area of concern for me is my condenser. Another area of concern for me is my evaporator. 
you, I, I've rarely seen a capillary leak, but it's also a culprit. Everybody here is a culprit. But looking at the cards that I got, I'm looking at the unit. I'm looking at what's accessible to me. And I want to work harder, not smarter. So knowing this, I would like now to go to the rear of the refrigerator again. So y'all can know my, my, my scheme and my, okay. There's some common, there, there's some really quick tests I could do here for my system. For example, if you notice, coming out of my uh, compressor, I'm going into my condenser. And then my condenser after it runs, watch this. After uh, follow this loop again. This is coming out of the compressor. Follow my hand. This is out, out of the compressor. It's a black copper tubing out of the compressor. Out of the compressor. See this? It goes all the way up, all the way up, all the way up, and then right here it begins its return. See all that? All the way back down, all the way back down, all the way back down to right here, right here. Richard, can you help me zoom into this? Right. So in in theory, if we if we if we pinch these two off, we can check our condenser. That seems like a pretty easy job. We just unsolder here, and we unsolder here. Right. And just doing that, we can isolate this, which is our condenser. That's one test we could do. Another test we can do is we can remove here, which is our suction line, and we can remove here, which is our capillary. Why do I say these two? Let's go back to the drill. Guys, take a mental note of this. You need to look at this and understand when I take you to the board, the correlation to the two. It does me no good showing you my crappy drawings. You have to know, like, uh, what am I? Okay, remember the, the 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 thicker diameter and the capillary. Just remember those two, okay? Thicker diameter and the capillary, okay? I'm gonna tell you why those are two important test points. Richard, can you take me to the drawing board? So. If you notice here, that thicker diameter, that is our, our suction, our return line. The, the, the Freon is traveling back to the compressor. So that one point of interest is over here, right? And the other one is our capillary, which is over here. So in theory, if we isolate here and here, if we have the leak anywhere in this, it's going to show. Let me get a, a marker to show you guys something. I want to show you guys that when you do this test, none of this matters. That's it, man. This is where we're going to hook up our, our axis. Five, another one down here. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull a vacuum here. Or we can put a PSI, anything. We, we, we now have isolated this system. I show you how we can do the same with the condenser over here. And after it goes through all of the loops, we can get it somewhere around over here before it goes into the yogurt. But still, we, we, we check in all this. Look how much turf and terrain isolating your system does. But again, we want to work smarter, not harder. I want to take a pause because Brother Rick has a hack. Please, sir. Yes, please, sir. The electronic leak detector here available uh, to show you, but I am going to explain to you one of the things. Uh, can we sort of... Like yes, sir. Zoom, let's zoom in, like, yep. like, here on the system. Okay. Uh, like, we, one of the questions was, electronic leak detector and salt detection, 
And, and I said, like, if you had a like, imagine this as being our electronic leak detector, and we're here, and we're checking this fitting here for a leak. If that high side is leaking, even though I'm over here, that freon's going to be floating through the air. The AC in the house, the fan, if it had a condenser fan, this freon's going to be flowing all around. Leak detector's going to go nuts. So one of the things I learned is you take a plastic bag like this and take a piece of that plastic bag and you wrap it around the braze joint. Not a big piece like that. Let me just cut a small piece. I got this. So, so you take a piece like this of, your, of, of a plastic bag, you wrap it around your joint loosely like this, and you're going to tape it tight on one side of the joint and tape it tight on the other side of the joint. And you make just a small hole in the bag that the probe of your leak detector go in there. So if this brace joint is leaking, the plastic will keep that Freon from flying all around the room. And if it's leaking and you put your leak detector uh, you know, the end of your detector inside that bag, it can tell you if that's the brace joint leaking. And the same thing, the high side, you just take, here's, here's the brace joint and we're going to take, and we're going to put the plastic bag here and we're going to tape on one side of it. And then we're going to tape the other side and we're going to tape the seam where the bag overlaps itself. You don't need to be that big in the bag, but you do this. One of the other tricks with the bag is let's just say you're testing this out. And the leak is so small, it's really hard for you to identify the leak. So if you take a couple of these bags and you wrap them around there, if you tape it up pretty good, the bag will fill up like a balloon. You tell the customer, listen, I'm going to charge the unit up. I don't know how long it's been leaking. It may have been leaking for, for six months before it leaked out enough for the customer to see it. So then I'm going to take a bag like this, wrap it around each one of my joints, tape it up real good. Use something like electrical tape or duct tape and tape it up real good. And then if that leak, if that joint was leaking, that Freon would actually cause the bag to fill up like a balloon. And it would be something for you to identify. You say, you look at all of them, and most of them are just like flat around the pipe. And then one of them is really big like a balloon, then that'll help give you an indication if that phrase joint is leaking. So like Brandon said, it looks like someone did work here and the leak is so small that it's very hard to tell which one of those is leaking. So if you think that someone did a sealed system job like this and you could not find the leak, one of the recommendations would probably be get the refrigerant out, take it. Well, I wouldn't even, the first thing I would do is I would, I would take it all apart and do it all again. And I wouldn't attempt to fix this brace joint. What I would do is I would take it and remove this brace joint, cut a piece of the tube and start the brace all over again from fresh. If you are putting a compressor in or any other brace joint, don't sit there and spend 30 minutes. Like you braced it, you tested the unit out, it leaked. You, you sanded it down, you braced it again, it leaked. Don't try to repair a leaking joint more than once. If it does not correct itself after one repair, then cut it out and start fresh. You know, take your time, make sure everything's clean, you flux it and everything else. By looking at some of these joints, there's so much freon in here. I'm sorry, there's so much solder on this joint here. It looks like most likely the leak might be this high side. Now, Brandon put soap, but it's very hard to see what's going on on the back side of that too. Okay, you can see this very well. So you want to have an inspection mirror or something like that where you can look behind it with a flashlight because it might be bubbling back here but it's very hard to see if it's a very small leak. And um, after that, if anybody has any questions about the bag or whatever, I'm going to turn it over back to Brandon. Let's finish uh, this demonstration. No, no, we won't. We're going to have to get the, the gauges. We're going to have to do what? The switches. Well, we got Freon in here, so we're going to cover it. Come on. Okay, so we're going to cover the Freon before we do anything. Yep. We're already connected to the gauges. The gauges. So let's get this stuff out of the way. Listen, you know, when I see guys do sealed system jobs, one of the most important things here is have your work area clean. Don't be so cluttered and and and, and we have a you question. Know, crap everywhere. Yes, what's the question? Uh, um, I need a tank too. Sure. Someone says, a Stan says, how about using something like a FLLIR camera to find specific temperature differences? Um, you're talking about the infrared, uh, camera? I guess so. 
Okay, so to be more specific in the question, as far as like, if I'm gonna use, the flare is basically like infrared where it shows a different color based on heat, okay? And you could use that on the evaporator if you want, I need extra hose. You, need, you can use that on the evaporator if you want, because the inlet of the evaporator and the outlet of the evaporator shouldn't be much difference in temperature. If we're low on Freon, that will help you know that, hey, I only have refrigerant in half of my coil. The same thing with the condenser. You know, the condenser gets hot at the top and it cools down at the end, so you're gonna have a slight change. But if you have a real high indication with that flare that, it, that this is hot, and here it's blue and, and showing representing cold, that, and that, that'll that work there too, whether, just letting you know if there's Freon in it. But if you, you could do that, the same thing with gauges. You know, if your pressures aren't right, if your high side and low side are both lower than normal, which is what we found when we first put the gauges on, that camera's not needed. The camera would be before you connect your gauges. If you suspect there's a sealed system, you could use something like that to get you started. So we have the low and the high side already connected, like Brandon connected. We're using the center hose here and it goes into our recovery machine. We have an inlet and an outlet. It says in underneath here and out. I don't think you can actually see it. Oh, yeah, we can. Uh, That's all. So this is in here and this is out. So the yellow hose from the gauge goes to the inlet and this here goes to the outlet. And we have two handles on here, the red and the blue. This says liquid and this says vapor. Really, they're all the same tank. The only difference is the liquid one. Can you lower the camera just a little bit? The liquid one has a stem that runs all the way to the bottom of the tank. So like in a regular tank, brand new Freon, you just turn the tank upside down so you get liquid coming out. So either one of these is gonna go into the tank. Um, normally what a, uh, a recovery machine does is it pulls the Freon out of the system is it condenses it into a liquid. And a lot of times you wanna pump into the tank as a liquid. It, and mainly that is for high volume refrigerants. It doesn't matter which one of the two we do for refrigerators because we're only talking about a few ounces. Now, last week I posted a couple of videos of someone working on a refrigerator and this was the refrigerator. This was an R1, uh, R12 refrigerator and we took the compressor out, the R134A compressor in here and charged it with 134A refrigerant made it work. But apparently one of the braze joints leaked. So that's why we're, we're in this. So we, we go ahead and set this up. Gonna go ahead and turn our gauges back on. We don't need to change the, the refrigerant type every time. That's why if I want oh, wait, to wait, wait, wait. Can I interrupt you? I'm so sorry. Sure. Guys, this is a good time to point out that it did equal us. Can you bring the gauges forward? Sure. See that? That's a pure equalization, right? That's about as good as it get. Sorry, Richard. It's okay. So we're gonna recover from both sides. So I'm gonna open up both gauges here. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn my recovery machine on. You do have to plug it in. A positive. Always verify one toy little box. Turn it in. According to the EPA, when you get a 10 inch vacuum, you can open this up for service. You don't need to be in a full 30 inch vacuum. And again, 30 inches would be uh, minus 14.7 on these digital gauges. So about five to seven inches in the vacuum on this system. And According to EPA, you could stop your recovery and open it up for service. So right now, what the system's doing, you want to back it up just a little bit? This is nothing more than a compressor and a condenser, just like these two pieces here. It's sucking out the refrigerant like a compressor does on a suction line. There's a condenser that cools it off and compresses it as a liquid and pump it into the tank. So we're about two inches. Uh, PSI vacuum. I say we get about seven to ten inches or more than enough 
into a, a vacuum where we can open it up to serve. So, it's already pretty much there. Yeah, we're six minus six the vacuum here. Okay, so we've recovered enough refrigerant. So the first thing we want to do when we're done or we reached our required vacuum level is go ahead and shut off our gauges first. Then we're going to shut off the tank. Then we turn our recovery machine off. So gauges, tank, then turn off the machine. The one thing I didn't do was really purge the hoses. We will get a slight little bit of air that's in the hoses into our system. That's really not gonna hurt anything in a recovery tank. So now that we pulled that vacuum, we can go ahead and disconnect our hoses and open the system up for service. Are uh, you ready to go, Brian? Sure. Any questions thus far? Guys, keep a clean work area because, man, if you try to work around this with that, it don't work good. Take a few minutes, clean up your work area. It also helps when you leave a new job, too. Okay. Are you going to use the torches to take the line of parts? You want to just cut it? Or you want well, no, the first thing I would do is I would probably take the cores out of the valves before I hit it with a torch. Okay. Uh, now, what, what I'm talking about, Brandon, is that we did pull the system into a vacuum, but there is a slight amount of refrigerant still trapped in the system. The fact that we pulled from both sides is the fastest way to recover, as well as uh, if you had a restriction, it's the only way you're going to get all the refrigerant out of the system. Now, since we didn't pull a perfect vacuum, there is still, still some Freon in there. So we're going to use a core removal tool, and we're going to take out what they call the valve core, which is what's inside of these valves here. That way, when he uses a torch on the system, uh, any refrigerant that is trapped in, as he's heating up the lines, the Freon is going to run away from these uh, core opening. So what he's doing now is he's removing the cores from the system. And there was a, a slight little bit that, that might have been the vacuum sucking yep. air in. Yep. So he removed the two cores from the system so he can service it now. Place them somewhere that you can find them. Because when you clean it up, you don't want to sweep them and you don't have a spare one in your bin. And then you tell the lady, you got to come back tomorrow because you lost your core. Don't ask me how I know because it happened to me. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next uh, subject matter at hand. Now, guys, this is this, this, multiple ways to skin a cat, man. So I'm going to give you Brother B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this up and I'm going to just pull that line out. That's what I'm going to do. Um, in a good scenario, you would want to put something up under here. Again, another brother B hack. What's up? Um, Talk to me. There's sir. enough lines that if you take the supports of the compressor, you can pull that out and have it out in the open for service. Is the compressor bolted down? No, just those clips. There's only two of them I think you put on. So. I'm talking about is, yeah, you can put a torch in there and braze it, but to reduce damage to the system, if you look at this unit, not all of them have this much refrigerant line, but if you disconnect the supports that hold the compressor into the refrigerator, um, you can pull that compressor out and do a lot of your brazing while the unit's out from the, the compartment, and that'll reduce any damage that could be done to the unit from your torches. Okay, and we're gonna do that. But I also wanna make one mention to guys, it's always in every unit, right? For most units, especially newer ones, there's some sort of board cover back here on your LGs, your Samsungs, there's always some sort of board cover. Another thing, you're more hiring those compressor kick plates, 
If you don't got nothing in the field, you got to get creative. You take one of them board covers and, you, again, brother, he hacks. You stick it right up on the hair like so. Now we don't got to do nothing. The work is done right there, and it's comfortable, and we're not worrying about anything. Uh, we have a question. Um, when uh, the turn a leak through recovery, we're not concerned with the reusing of refrigerant. Uh, when if, whenever do we use refrigerant? We can always reuse refrigerant, but according to EPA regulations, reuse of refrigerant can only be back in the system that you removed it from. Now, it's weird. That, that law is sort of weird because if you've got a 30-pound or 25-pound recovery tank and you recovered from five different refrigerators before you got to this customer's house, you're using everybody's refrigerant. As long as the refrigerant is not contaminated, you can reuse that refrigerant in the system. And unlike what I did when I hooked up the recovery machine, I would have purged everything to reduce any air or moisture from getting into the system. Did that answer your question? Thank you, Rachel, for answering that gentleman's question. So you're going to leave it in there? You I'm going to take it out. And then after we, after I take it out, I'm going to clean it all up. Make it look, make it look decent. Let me switch the tripod on this camera so it'll be a little bit closer to the... Uh, one second, guys. Camera is going to be relocated to a little bit closer to him doing the job. Trust me, I always try to find a better and easier way to do a job than someone else does. If you watch my video on changing the evaporator on a refrigerator, I don't follow the instructions that the manufacturer puts in there. I, I created my own by adding that 516 elbow in that video. Uh, because I found that damage less tubing and it was easier to, to install. Okay, so Brandon sanded it. You can see how clean that that pipe is. So now he's going to prepare it for brazing. Now, and another thing I want to say, guys, uh, this, this you're going to get a little bit of resistance, right? Oh, shit. We'll, we'll you know go what? over top of this one. No, no, go, go over top of this one. There you go. Yeah, but you know what was a little... Go over this one. Guys, look, there may be a little resistance, right? When I start trying to push this guy in. So again, he is my friend. If I notice that it won't go in due to the solder buildup, I'm gonna actually use that to my favor, warm it up and then push it in. But I'm gonna push it in deep because I don't want that solder coming back up in here and restricting my, my line. Okay, I want to add one of the, let go of it for one second. Go ahead. So notice how this is a steel pipe. This is not copper tubing. So it's very, very stiff. So when he goes to put it in here, watch when I let it go, what happens to it? It wants to go back. So when you're going to braise this into the compressor, bend the whole pipe past the compressor, okay? Bend it past your, past your compressor. Um, so now that he bent it like that, and then we go to put it in the, in, the, in the compressor. Look at that. I let it go. It doesn't want to fly back out. The, the, the tension of the pipe now is pushing this <clears> way, <throat> wanting to fly back out. So now he can bend it. So it's, it's probably going to be a little bit straighter to the line. You can use your thumb. I, I, I have a question. Use sure, go ahead. What do you got? Um, Rick, do you have like a trick or hack on how to remove excessive solder in like construction line. I've had a lot of that, those pieces. Okay. From inside the line or from outside? Like from pre- Okay, from I'm pre not even gonna, gonna use any force. I'm just gonna heat it up and it should go right in on its own. Okay, one second, you had a question. What do you say? Uh, if you're talking about solder that's inside the compressor, inside the pipe, Oof. that's what we were doing with the screw. If we had a couple of different size screws that had coarse threads, we screwed the screw into the opening of the pipe and then we heated it up with the torch and used the screw to pull the solder out. 
You might have to have a couple of screws that go from smaller to larger as when you heat it up, the solder liquefies, but it'll stick to your screw. And then when you pull the screw out, that solder will come out with it. Now, if it's too bad, you're just gonna have to take a hacksaw or I actually use a Dremel and I cut a little piece of this pipe off right here so that um, I, I have a fresh piece. So if it's really built up with solder, that's what we were just doing a minute ago when he had this screw, he screwed it in. You could see here, do you see how some of the solder is sticking to the end of that screw? He screwed it into the hole and then we heated up the pipe with the torch, pulled it out. The solder comes out with the screw. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it doesn't matter what material the screw is? Um, you, want, you want something that, that's, that's, you know, it doesn't have to be stainless steel but you don't want to use like a real cheap screw. Don't use anything that's got paint on it or anything else. You want a, one of these silver type screws, a, a, a steel screw would be just fine. Uh, yeah. Steel can, can accept the heat and the solder will stick to it and just pull it right out. And you can see again, I don't know if you can see the solder that's on there. He pulled yeah, solder sure. out and we did it with more than one screw. Okay, uh, that works. So he's trying to use teeth to soften up the solder inside so that the pipe will go a little bit deeper in the compressor. Oh yeah, she went in. Oh yeah, she's good. She went in substantially. I do want to say one thing. I see why this happened, though. I can point something out. Go ahead. Okay, you go first, as well. Well, I could tell that this, 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 the diameter, this compressor, again, we it wasn't the OEM or the original. So if you notice, the diameter is a lot larger um, on the compressor than it is on the diameter of the condenser. And uh, that's probably what led to all that. So the more ideal thing would have been probably put a, a one quarter and then make this go into the one quarter or pinch here. You want to do that? Let's, let's, let's do either one you want to do. Pinching is going to be a little hard at this point with all that side. It's probably super stiff. understand what I'm saying? No, no. That yes. makes a little bit more sense, right? Yeah, that, that'd be fine. So we're gonna, what we'll do is gonna add an extension onto the compressor and we're gonna use a small piece of pipe so that if you look at this, this line, you see all that space between that line and the compressor. When we try to solder, it's gonna fill up and possibly cause a restriction or leak. So he's gonna add a piece of pipe there. He's gonna take this back out, add a piece of pipe in between that's gonna be large enough to fit in the compressor but also allow uh, for our uh, discharge line that it can to get into it. And again, guys, just just because this looks like that don't mean it's good. It's still good practice to fit it up. I forgot what I was going to say before. <laughs> Damn, my bad, bro. That's okay. Uh, oh yeah, so you know how he was sticking that uh, condenser line inside the compressor? On the other side of the compressor, it's connected to a very small pipe internal into that compressor. And if you push the line too deep in, you can actually restrict up. Like if you stick this too deep into the compressor, this pipe here, uh, inside the compressor, that tube that we're seeing, this, this tube right here is connected to a smaller pipe on the other side and it curves up and goes to the top of the compressor. If you push your line in too deep in there, especially this small one, you could block off the end of this pipe. So you got to be careful not to push this in too deep, not past this point of the compressor. So we'll get this out of the way for now. Again, I'm going to cut all this, guys. I just want to get it kind of in. Oh, she's a beauty. Okay, she won't go in again. We're going to use heat and get it in.
But now they got it in. It's going to go ahead real quick and brace that baby right up. Gentlemen, I have a question in regards to what Brother B is currently doing um, uh, one, with the One second. One second. I can't hear you over the torch. This extra copper that we have, you should always have a little bit of quarter, five sixteenths, and three eighths on your truck, even if it's just a foot long. Um, whenever you change out the system, or even if you scrap out a refrigerator, cut a few pieces off so you have extra if you don't want to buy a roll. As far as the question someone had about swagging or swagging the end of the compressor, when the compressor's new, yes, you can swag the compressor because those lines uh, will take some of the expansion. But this one here had solder on the joint. So um, if you attempted to, to use a swagging tool on that, it is very possible that um, that pipe will split because the solder is different material and the, and the actual tube. So you can actually cause the pipe to crack. So adding a pipe like this makes it a lot easier than trying to um, swag the compressor when you've already got solder all over the joint. Now, if it's brand new, you can, but make sure you use, hold on one second. And brother, while he's doing that, hold on, oh, go ahead. Oh, Make sure you use this swagging block on the compressor before you take your tool and, and, and you, you try to open it up. If you just use this tool on the open pipe, you will crack it where it welds to the compressor and you'll damage it. It'll either crack or it'll bend the pipe. So you still want to put this against the compressor over the pipe that you're swagging and then use a swagging tool to open it up at that point. But again, if it's got solder on it, it might not work too good. And, and to answer that one brother's question, brother, sometimes, again, brother, be hacked. You got to get creative, man. What I will, what you could do is you could pull this out and cut yourself a little bit. And that little bit, you can use it here like I did and just reduce your length here. You know, you may have to get a little creative. You know? I, I, and speaking of that, these lines, if you see this valve was added to the dryer filter with a super long uh, pipe. And normally the valve has only got a pipe this long on it when you get the valve. This was added on because I tell my technicians that work for me, you are supposed to remove this valve when you charge a system. You're not supposed to leave the valves on the system. So I told them, take a piece of about a foot, foot and a half long of pipe, solder it to your valve. So once you've charged up your system, your pinch off pliers would go here and then you would cut this tube and then you solder the end of this tube up here. And now you still have the valve with a pipe here and you can reuse this valve over and over again. So what he was showing you, the valve on the suction line and the valve on the dryer filter, why they're so long is because I was explaining, we can use these valves over and over again, just keep adding some pipe to it. Once you've serviced it, then you got room to cut off and you leave a little bit of pipe here so if you need to come back into the system in the future, you have a way to tap into the system. Thank you, Brother Rich. Um, could you, would you be able to link that video of the addition of that um, the joint? Uh, I think that's very useful to, uh, to see in and of itself. <laughs> Trust me, guys, I've been doing this for 40 years. Any penny you can save, you know, these valves don't cost a lot of money, but with as many trucks I have on the road, and if you got guys servicing all day, these things add up, you know, these valves are reusable. I normally, when I work on them, I don't even leave the cores inside the valves because I'm going to cut them off and remove them when I'm done with my job. And when you pull a vacuum on a system before you charge it back up, you don't leave the cores inside of it. Taking the cores out will speed up your evacuation process. So yeah, you can always add a little bit of pipe on your suction line or your discharge line. Sometimes you have to cut a piece off uh, to make the system fit the way you want it to. So what he's doing is he's uh, using a tubing bender to bend his discharge line so it'll fit that piece he just made. Make an attempt. To. Hold on, let me move the light a little bit so people can see a little bit. Okay, now we may have to wedge just a tad. 
Okay, so here's your block in this. So he's going to have to open that up and you don't have, this is not quarter inch. This is smaller than one quarter. So he's not going to go the full distance of a quarter. He's just going to open it up. So this fits in there nice and easy. Um, and again, if he doesn't put that tool on the pipe, um, the pipe will bend. So that gives you a way to hold on to the pipe while you're trying to uh, put your swagging tool. There's another question. Let me see. Hard to see from here. Is that Rudy? I'm sorry. Was that Rudy? Uh, no, that's actually was another person. Oh. <laughs> I know he said something about reinventing the wheel. <laughs> you know, I'm in, let me get one. Give me one second. I have a now, when you're putting that swagging block on your pipe, make sure that this, you can see here, there's a, a slight gap in your tool. And if it's not tight enough on your pipe, it is possible that the pipe can slide out of your block. So, um, that's too big. Uh -oh, yeah. That's too big. No, use this one. Yeah. You don't need to go too far. Just go past. Just this. a little bit to let it in. So, you want to hold. I'm giving a hand here. I'll hold this for you. Got it, got it. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, he's just going to beat it in. I want to be able to see what, what's going on with the tool. Okay, so he didn't open it up too much. Sometimes when you cut a pipe, it makes your opening smaller. So if you, if you look on the back of your tubing cutter here, there's a reaming tool. Ream out your pipe, and that may be all you need to do to make this one fit, like here. If, if you look this here at this pipe, go ahead and see if this will fit in there. He's going to try to see if it'll fit in there. No. And it doesn't fit. So we're going to ream this out. And when you ream it, don't hold your reaming tool on the top because any filings that'll go into your system. So what you do is you ream it this way. Ream it this way upside down. And we're using a blade here. This is on the end of your tubing cutter. All right. And then there's a little bit of filings. I don't know if you can actually see it. There's some filings on the end of that pipe there. So we just take our little sandpaper. I'm gonna do the outside of it. And I'm also gonna set it down and I'm just gonna file off the end to get any parts. Now, if we take that, that pipe, you wanna see if it'll fit now? I'll hold the camera for you. But now that we've just reamed it out, that pipe fit right in there. Beautiful. You see? So. Depending on your pipe sizes, not all of them you can ream and get them to connect together, but those two are so close in size that reaming the pipe will help you get it in there sometimes. Flux that one? No, she's good. Yeah. Got flux right here. Oh boy, she's good, man. Look how much better she looks. Oh, fuck that yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them, one of them we put some moisture in there, so let's try, try this one. I have some also. Yeah, I think so, but... Whoa, that's a hard desert. Okay, so this flux dries out. You can always add a little bit of water to them. Show me some hot stuff. Okay, so let me see if I get the camera. So we don't want to put a lot, but when the flux dries out like this, you want to use just a little bit of water. Just a little bit like that. And then I'm actually just going to use the solder because the flux is going to be used for soldering anyways. And you stir it up like this. And you want not too much water. You don't want it runny. Just a little bit of water. What you want is almost like a toothpaste consistency to see what's on the end of my stick here. So you can mix that up. Make sure that when you're done, you close this really good. But the people are using it, this top wasn't on there right. And... 
it wasn't it dried out so go in there and then now we got a little bit more of a toothpaste consistency so he put a little bit of flux on both pipes this will help the solder stick and reduce what we call oxidization when you heat tubing oxygen is released and that actually makes the pipe dirty and causes problems where the solder doesn't stick too well. Oh man, I forgot, oh. man. It'll work. No, but I don't like that. Won't work. Look, guys, plug, shameless plug. These guys right here, they come with a flux on them already. You I mean, even gotta do that. But you already fluxed it. Yeah, freaks through it. But Richard, I like to use a 45 on this. Yeah, I don't think we have 45. I do have 45. All right, so he's going to get 45. And, and if for those of you who don't know, sil floss uh, is the silver solder that's used. Let me see if it's got printed on here. Yeah, like if you look at the numbers on here, let me see if I can get it close enough for the camera. Uh, you see sil floss. There we go. Sil floss. And let me see. I don't know if you guys can see it. Can you guys see that? I can't. No. I'm trying to, oh. to see it. Right there, yeah. Right there? Well, zoom out. Right there. Okay. Self okay. loss 15. 15. The number 15, or you hear, like, if you look at what he's got in his hand, call that 45. It almost looks like capillary tube. The 15 and 45 means what percentage of silver is in the mixture of alloys that makes up this solder. So he prefers 45, which is usually recommended when you're doing copper to steel, which is the condenser, you can use 15, but the 45 does not take as much heat and it's a lot easier to stick it to the tube. When you're brazing that, that joint that he's doing there, you're going copper to steel. Those are two different metals. And so it takes different temperatures to braise it. So he's going to take that back now and he's going to go ahead and he's going to braise that, that joint up. Make sure that the joint's good and hot. If the pipe's not hot enough, the solder will just rip off. Look at that base joint. If that ain't professional, then, then there's no such thing as a professional. That's a beautiful looking joint. And the one that he did back there on the compressor, I, I will give him a certification when he's done. Oh, thank you, young man. I worked very hard for it. All right. So, guys, I think now's a good time to end. Okay. And we'll save this refrigerator for the next class where we'll evacuate it and charge it. Yeah, we're going to. Different charging methods. Yeah. Guys, we ran out of time. Um, it's already one hour and a half into it, but uh, let's talk about uh, any last questions and we'll resume the test in the part two. Any final questions? The next class will we'll evacuate. Oh, wait, we have one. Talk Maybe about another topic for another class, but do you charge for the time per hour or flat rate for a job like this? Flat rate. What do you say? I charge flat rate. Flat rate is usually what you would charge. Yeah, flat system. rate, guys. Yep, that's why we charge accordingly. And, uh, and, and there is something called a blue book that you can get, which has an estimated pricing chart of what you would charge customers for specific jobs. Just search appliance repair blue book, and it has prices for almost any job that you could do on any appliance. Um, so again. The next class next week, Saturday, we're going to evacuate, showing you micron gauge and how to use it, how to set it up. We're going to talk about charging the system, how do we charge it, and what kind of pressures we're going to look for, and how we look at the system, see if it's charged properly. And then we'll pinch off and remove these valves and show you how we use a pinch off tool and how we tell if that tool is pinched off properly before we cut it off or release. Anything else? Thank you guys for everything, man. Love, peace, and harmony, man. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you for joining us and appreciate your support. And we'll see you in two weeks. Yes, sir. I'm going to upload this to YouTube. I'm going to clean it up. And I'll upload it.
Isturi 